everybody. Uh, today we have a special guest uh, with the HR Evolution, somebody that's firmly on the team here that uh, is working towards revolutionizing the function of HR through the evolution for the evolution of business. Um, and Robert himself is so passionate about this that um, he decided to start his own company. Um, so Alumo <laughs> <laughs> is one of my favorites in the market today. Um, but we're here to really talk about what he's learning, what they're seeing in the marketplace. And really focusing on kind of keeping lines of communication open with our employees and how important that is, that we're truly listening to what they're telling us and driving our strategy based off of what they're telling us to, to better serve the business itself. So Robert, welcome. I'm so excited to be having this chat with you today um, because I know it's something that you and I are extremely passionate about is, is, is we're both data junkies, recovering addicts from data. So <laughs> what's, um, sure. one of the things that I wanted to ask you is why did you start Alumo? Yeah, you know, it's um, as I've run, I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur. I love uh, different organizations, driving business, um, but one of the things that I've learned through that experience was pretty life changing for me. It's uh, and we'll have to tell, probably don't have time to tell my personal story, uh, uh, my evolution and my awakening. But long story short, I'll say that I essentially had a real clear awakening to what really drives an organization and the role that people play within that organization. And as we, as I grew my last organization, it was just an amazing experience that we had. I, I feel like, you know, years ago, I had talked about people and culture. I, you know, knew that it was important, but I frankly didn't really know how to implement it within an organization, how to leverage people and culture into, you know, driving the organization forward, and frankly, really just the critical importance that it has. And so as <clears throat> my team on in my last organization was just phenomenal. And we all together went on just an amazing journey of learning how to really focus on our people and culture, and how that literally changed everything in our business and drove all of our results. Wow. And so one of the frustrating things is going through that process was, is I always had really good data, you know, all kinds of amazing BI tools, you know, <laughs> dashboards, everything that shows me everything going on in the business. But yet when it came to people and culture, we literally had, you know, nothing but lagging indicators. And so after selling that company and such a focus and a belief and just, you know, that was the key to our success. Um, I, I got connected with this organization and was just so excited about what they were starting and the concepts about how we could get real time human sentiment analytics, because that's what I was always missing. You know, show me where we're doing in regards to people and culture, because I've always believed that those are leading indicators to your ultimate outcomes. Wow. And that's what we've seen. That's what we've proven. And so now we've built a technology that I think is one of the, probably well, of course I'm biased, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think is the most important key element to driving your business results is literally understanding in real time your people because yeah, your yeah. people drive your results. So. Well, and the, and the world externally is changing so so fast, right? And, and a lot of it, a company cannot change and they have no control over, right? That socioeconomic climate, a lot of things that are happening externally of their walls that they have no control over, but the people are bringing inside their walls. And, 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 and that's why culture is never, you never like completed culture. I think a lot of people are no. like, oh, we made it. And it's like, nope, culture is ever evolving and ever changing. Just like the best leaders are always learning and uh, new, new skills, new traits. Um, they're developing, sharpening their weapon. Um, did you find, though, uh, kind of based off of your experience here as a, as a leader, because a lot of them know how important culture is, like you mentioned. A lot of people understand that their people are important, but they still find themselves trapped in that leadership because they're answering to the key stakeholders, the board members, and they might not be as on board, right, with the, the, the emotional, right? Uh, people find culture to be kind of emotional. It's, and people are unpredictable. And I think that's, that's why some people are like, well, forget it. We're just going to try to make the best out of this situation. Um, yeah. How did, how did you, I guess, uh, like how did, when you were going through your own evolution, right, Robert, and, and coming to this determination, what did it take? Because 
talk is cheap, right? How did you start driving that into action? Well, I think that's exactly right. Is that a lot of organizations, in fact, many of the organizations that we see um, as we work with a variety of <laughs> different organizations, we see that people and culture is more of a, it's a, they know just like I did, right? Where they know it's important, but, you know, okay, do we throw another party at it? Do we get another ping pong table? Do we, you know, what is it that we do? Do we have another summer party? I think tags right? How work. do we drive this tags work a little bit. <laughs> right. And so you think that it's these, those types of things. And those, those aren't negatives. I don't mean that to be negative. Like those are, those are also important parts of an overall culture, right? And an environment and an experience. But I, I really like to think about it as the overall employee experience. Mm -hmm. Your people want to come to work in a place where they feel supported, where they feel like there's opportunities to grow, all these different components. And it's not a one, it's not just one thing that you need to do. So the key is, is just like with any relationship, right? Communication. Yeah. Well, you have to be able to communicate and understand where your people are in a real time basis. Mm -hmm. You know, the old school traditional surveys, for example, of, you know, once a year, you know, that whole concept, that's just the, about the worst idea you've ever had. Um, because what we did is, you know, and, and it's an evolution, right? We yeah. started with, hey, we should start listening to our people. And then we started doing it. And then we systemized it, systematized it into, hey, once a year, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that process is just terrible for yeah. a every of reason. reason under the sun. Yeah. But the bottom line is, is that companies just like, like, like you mentioned with, with Coulter, it is a living, breathing thing. It's a relationship that you have with your people. Mm -hmm. And so that relationship requires consistent communication and you need to be able to be in touch live and know, hey, look, we're struggling with this. Well, OK, great. Now I can take action if I understand because I can't fix what I don't understand. Mm -hmm. But if I understand where those gaps are, well, rather than once a year, try to figure that out. What if I could get that information every single day? Mm -hmm. to know exactly and make little teeny minor adjustments and quick and nimble. You know, we just don't work on that type of schedule anymore. How can you try to do something once a year yeah. and take initiatives? You're always looking at things rearward and going back and all of that. So that's where we just designed a technology to help you very quickly, easily engage with your people every single day to listen and learn from their experience and then take action based on that and then long-term measure your progress. So it's not, I like to say it's not rocket science, it's yeah. people science, Yes, <laughs> but it's just creating it in a way that, yes, you can literally listen to them and engage and understand the sentiment, where they are, how they think and feel, because mm -hmm. that drives their behaviors mm -hmm. and their behaviors drive your results. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's one of our, one of our favorite people is Dr. Nick Molinaro, who, who knows that better than anybody. I mean, we, we so know right. the importance of, of understanding our mind. Right. And, and I think there's a difference between mind and our brain, right? Well, brain is nature versus nurture or fight or flight response, right? Where the mind is that if we're better understanding about how we're making our decisions each day, um, we're making 30,000 of them. It, it will probably be best in our best interest to really understand how we're making those decisions or how that individual, because now we're starting to hear things like individualized HR, right? Yes. It's no longer like that spray and pray, or uh, I always say that catch all, <laughs> right? Where it's like, okay, well, majority of our working population is going to find this effective, right? My problem with the surveys, Robert, and like you said, is in the performance review process today is most organizations is, are still relying on those annual reviews, right? It's a snapshot, right? And that's why I love the constant feedback back and forth, because odds are that performance review is probably only realistically a snapshot of maybe 30 days before, or even 60 days, I would even say. I can't even remember what I had for lunch the other day. <laughs> so the one thing that you talked about is action, right? So those surveys and a lot of these employers, as they're determining how they're going to get back to work or let's get back to normal. Um, and they're trying to force people back like our friends down in New York City, a banking learned the hard way and really right. destroyed probably their public recognition and culture. Um, how does, how do you see them taking like the daily conversations right before it gets to that boiling point where the person's like, 
they talk with their feet, right? If they're not happy, they're going to talk with their feet and leave. And we're having conversations with their great resignation right now. How much more important and more effective have you found to have that information daily rather than even quarterly or some that might say, hey, we do them twice a year, we're good. It's still just not enough. What have you seen and what have you found with that constant communication that have made you a better leader or a manager? Yeah, what really changes is just the whole dynamic. So instead of this once a year annual thing, like my brother and I, I, I have to tell the story because <laughs> he came over, you know, over the holidays and I still just, I laugh at it every time, but he came over the holidays and he says, oh yeah, my company just sent out our annual survey and he's a, one of their leaders. And he's like, I've been just fighting and pulling teeth and, you know, trying to bribe, do anything I can to try to get people to fill this out. And I said, so why is that? Why did people not want to fill it out? And he says, what I hear from everybody is that we keep saying the same thing and nothing ever happens. Yeah, exactly. And it's more detrimental at the, in the long run. That's right. They're actually, it's, it's, it's damaging their culture. It's a disengagement survey because <laughs> what they've done is they've created They've created something that says, hey, we want to make a change, but then we never do. And so they've done just the opposite effect, right? Mm -hmm. So the intention is good. Hey, let's listen and do that type of thing. But then the actions behind it just don't tie in. Mm -hmm. There was some really good research from uh, OC Tanner that showed like an 800% belief, you know, increase in their belief that you can do things. If you can do things within 30 days and tie feedback to action that quickly, that's where the real magic happens. And that's where people start. That's how you change a culture. Yeah. You know, that's a core element of culture. When you're an organization sending an annual survey, a semi-annual survey, that's your culture that you're putting out in front of them. Mm -hmm. And you're showing them, hey, well, here's how we listen and effectively, here's what we value and how we approach you as our people. To, and our, this is our effort mm -hmm. at listening to you. Mm -hmm. Well, if that effort is so ineffective, it's actually creating damage to your organization. So that's why we wanted, what I recognized was, is that, you know, I need to know what's happening, what's working and what's not on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Because when things are small, you know, if I've got some sparks going over here, yeah. that's when I want to be able to put out the fire, not after it becomes this huge issue that I have to now do damage control. Yeah. You know, like I, I saw in the news the other day, um, you know, a, large restaurant company, I won't say the name of the company, but large restaurant company, and they're getting hit with a sexual harassment lawsuit, right? Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And I sat there and thought, well, you know, with our platform, we would have heard about that because we have heard about that from our other clients in different places. And we catch them when they're sparks before they become this huge issue. Yeah. We PR bubble nightmare. up what's happening on the front line to the top line and we eliminate, because I, I call it leadership fog, but all of those levels of management in between to where the executives in most companies have a very distorted view of what's actually really happening. So, so what we need to do is get that live data and insight so that you know what your real culture is, not the fake one that people tell you or that your managers tell you, because, hey, that's your boss or your subordinates are frankly going to tell you what they think they want, what you want to hear. Yes. And what you need is real candid insights about what's going on and consistently, because once you can get that type of data and insight, man, you can make the changes, you can drive the organization forward, you can eliminate those roadblocks that are going on. But again, you can't fix what you under, don't understand. And so that's what you need. You need that unlimited real time insight into, hey, oh, we have this problem over here. We got that manufacturing problem over here. We have these issues with some of our leaders in these areas. Okay, let's go get them the help and training they need. You know, they say 75% of people leave an organization because of a bad boss. Well, yeah. if you don't know where you have good and bad bosses, then how are you going to fix your retention problem? Oh, yeah. And I right? have found so, too, Robert. Have you? <laughs> Sorry, had, I, I can't go with. <laughs> no, no. I was going to say though, to, to that point, right? Because um, that's a conversation that I have with a lot of HR practitioners and leaders, right? If I can tell you in your, let's say, organization who has the highest turnover, right? What are you going to do with that information? 
it's almost like that information is not enough, right? Because they don't do anything with it in most cases, right? The manager has been there for 20 years based off tenure. There's no possible way that we can get rid of Betty. She's always been in that role. We know how we know that she's not really an effective leader. Um, she can't, she, she's poor at communicating to the multi-generational workforce. Now as more millennials and Gen Z's come in, we're just, we're just turning over faster and faster in that department. That's usually what people come back with. However, they probably have not had sentiment analytics like you're saying today. How do you feel like sentiment analytics help from a conversation, a critical conversation perspective that these HR practitioners and leaders can then go have with a manager to really enable their success? Because at the end of the day, they're probably trying to climb the same corporate ladder, right? That's how they've defined success. Right. Have you found that sentiment analytics have armed them with more material to have a more meaningful conversation with those managers? Sentiment analytics are the key to your success. And let me share with you why, because as you mentioned, like your turnover rates, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that you need to know is what those are. That's like mm -hmm. step one. Okay, mm -hmm. let's go figure out where we're turning over people and identifying that. And that's where people analytics, you know, there's a huge push for that to identify all these key aspects of people analytics. But people analytics to me is step one, yeah. because people analytics gives you the data of the outcomes, the, the results, right? So, hey, here's your churn rates with these or these demographics or whatever. And they're critical to know. But now, once you identify, for example, like one of the things that started this years ago was Google with Project, um, you know, even I think it was, well, I think it was before, yeah, it was, be, sorry, I'm getting oh. Project Aristotle yeah. <laughs> confused in there. But Google noticed, it's one of the things that really drove them to their whole people analytics was that they recognized that they were losing women within the organization. And so what they decided, of course, was, hey, let's take a very data approach. Let's go figure out why the why behind the numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's what I call sentiment analytics. People analytics is great data surrounding the outcomes of what's happening with our people. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing then that you need in order to address it, right? You can't fix what you don't understand. Yeah. So you've got to find out and get the understanding as to the why behind the numbers. And that's what sentiment analytics does. That's the difference in why Alumo is such a powerful tool is because once you know, hey, we're losing people, we're having these issues, which we can also show you in our platform. But the most important thing that we do is we ask and engage with your people through a simple text. Mm -hmm. We ask questions surrounding the why they feel the way they do mm -hmm. because it's your people's mindsets and beliefs that drive their behaviors and their behaviors, the things they do, then create your business outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I always share with leaders that, yeah, if you want better results, we've got to focus on the mindsets and beliefs and align those to our organizational objectives. Oh, God. That's and amazing. so that's the, the whole key is if you don't know how your people will think and feel, where their issues are, and that's, you know, again, those things change, right? My relationship with you is different than it was last week yeah. or, you know, with my wife or something like that, right? If you don't stay up to date with that communication, then the gaps happen. And when you don't pay attention to that individual or to people and culture consistently, then you can head off clear over here and you're making these huge swings where if you're getting daily insight surrounding what's happening with your people, you can make these immediate adjustments. Mm -hmm. And they're smaller yeah. adjustments, right? It's, it's everybody's afraid of change, but if you're taking smaller bites to, to to finish the apple or the cookie, let's say, it's it's more effective, right? And you touched on it earlier. I feel like a lot of businesses are in this constant state of fighting fires, right? Everything yeah. comes uh, to always fighting the outcomes exactly. Instead of instead of like preparing, right, or preparing for a potential roadblock and being able to solve those challenges. And what I'm hearing you say is that constant line of communication, that back and forth is vitally important because you can adjust strategies on the fly. And that's what I love data, right? And you and I, why we're data junkies, it not only tells us that we have a cough, we have a sneeze, we have a fever, but it also has the ability to then diagnose why it's happening with these sentiment analytics, right? It's one thing to go in 100%. with a cough, with a fever. Hey, doc, I don't know what's going on, but I'm experiencing X, Y, and Z. Well, the doctor then only simply is taking that information and aligning it with what could it be, right? And we continue to use data to drive deeper and deeper. 
But there comes a point where still in data, whether we talk about data manipulation as a necessity to take more information from the data that we already have and gain new insights, this is taking a different route, right? This is actually then saying why they are experiencing this. Why are they dissatisfied? Why are they leaving within 90 days? Um, because I've always find it, found it borderline comical, right, Robert, what organizations <laughs> that don't do exit interviews. Um, I think that they're disgruntled, right? They're upset that the employee is finally determined to, to leave the organization. Um, and they're missing out on that gold, if you will. How um, do you have like a favorite customer um, experience that you know that has used Alumo that you just wanted to share kind of how they utilize the tool at the beginning, where they kind of are in their journey today and how they continue to evolve and utilize this tool to, to make them a better business or, or, and drive that culture? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll share with you a little bit about a company called Big Leap. And, you know, Big Leap, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, they're a digital marketing agency. And some, several of their clients or multiples of their clients had pulled back, you know, put their marketing on hold as the pandemic first started. And so they actually, and they started with us like the, a few weeks, a couple of weeks before really the pandemic hit hard. And then there were some shutdowns and remote working and all of those different things. And so we had some really good baselines about where they were within the organization before any of this. And then we got to measure through that entire app, wow. you know, wow. set of team. And Big Leap, and I can, we can certainly you know, get a link and it's on our website. And there's also on our YouTube channel, you can see some different videos surrounding their experience. Um, but essentially, you know, they went through, they had to do some layoffs and as we implemented the product, again, one of the things we do is we, we engage through an SMS text because we've just found that that's the mode. That's what works. Everybody responds. You know, we have huge, amazing engagement rates. The last time I looked at their uh, engagements, it was 90 plus percent. Wow. You know, that's this is huge over a year later. A tool like this. It's over a year later. And they, that's amazing. You know, their engagement, people always ask me, well, if you're engaging with your people once a week, don't they get tired of talking or sharing or, you know, having conversations with you? And I'm like, well, only if you don't take action on it, people don't get <laughs> tired of giving you feedback. If you, if you actually go and help solve their problems, they want their problems solved just like you do. Everybody wants the business to grow and succeed and it to be a great working environment. The problem is most companies literally just don't listen well enough to their people and they don't solve the problem. So then their people leave. Mm -hmm. it, it's not rocket science, yeah. but with these guys, what happened was, as they went through that process and, you know, imagine going through and having to do layoffs. Well, one of the things, you know, there's an industry standard called employee net promoter score mm -hmm. and their EMPS score, I think was down in the sixties or something, still a phenomenal for most organizations yeah. like to see a 60 <laughs> is amazing, right? These guys were a serious people company, really focused and they just wanted to get better. And that's why they brought us in. But what happened there was, is that over the next few months, they actually drove up going through layoffs and everything. They drove up their EMPS score to like an 84 or five or something. Wow. Like that. And the, you know, they went up by 30%. And I looked at some statistics and other organizations, I saw um, that most organizations that had gone through any type of layoff or, or furlough had seen a 94% reduction in their EMPS Holy score. Holy cow. Of course, right? If yeah, and that's what I would assume. Well. Yeah. To, yeah, let people go, then of course people aren't happy with your company. But what they did is they jumped into the platform. They engaged with their people. They listened very closely. The executive leaders themselves do dove into the platform, having anonymous conversations with their people so that they could listen and learn very intently about the experience about, hey, here's what we're doing. How do you feel about this? What are your thoughts about this? And as they engaged in those conversations, their people felt listened to, they felt heard, they knew that the company was doing everything it possibly could to support them and everyone around them. They knew that they were, you know, they just had such a increase in trust mm -hmm. of the organization because everything was open. They were very communicating. 
And they were able to have those personal one-on-one converse, one -on -one conversations to listen and learn, oh, you know, this person's feeling this way. And so what could we do as a company to help address those things? And then they took immediate intentional action. In fact, in one of the little videos, you know, Carrie there, um, uh, I can't remember if she's their chief people officer or what her exact title is, sorry. But Carrie Kratz there did such an amazing job with the team. And she says, you know, what we've learned is that gathering this live real-time feedback is amazing as long as we then take that. And so we've got really, really good at taking immediate intentional action. Wow. I, ha I had a conversation with another chief people officer of another company and they were like, well, what am I going to do with feedback every single day? You know, I like my once a year, then I go create a project and then I go try to do this. And then, you know, it's this old school. Yes. Okay. We learned this. Now we're going to try to put a committee together and then we're going to go try to take some, well, by the time you do anything eight months later, your people don't even remember that that was the problem you were trying to solve. Yeah. We're, it's almost like steering the Titanic into the Erie Canal is, is because they, and, and by eight months later, like you said, they already forgot about it. And it's probably too late in most scenarios. That's right. You're, you're not even focused on what the, what people want is, Hey, my experience today, if I'm having issues, troubles, problems, you know, things like that, I want you to know about them today and help me resolve them today. Not six, eight months later, or I, Hey, I just sit here because the company never changes, never listens. Well, if you can create that type of a culture, mm -hmm. that's the where you get the innovation. That's where yeah. you get engagement. You create engagement by engaging people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. not by talking about it, by yeah. actually engaging them in the process. So mm -hmm. we teach a process to help work with your people to co-create solutions. And literally, you just create this amazing new environment where it's, hey, Look, we know and trust that if we go into a LUMO and provide information, the company's listening and they're taking action. And then we get involved on how to solve these problems because now they start having faith. So that's where we see such high engagement rate. They have this faith and belief in your organization that something will happen. Yeah. Well, once that happens, once you start that ball rolling, yeah. it's phenomenal mm -hmm. because now people are engaged and they're looking for, hey, Actually, I can make a difference. And when I see that that's a problem over there, I know that if I say something that the company will listen mm -hmm. and we'll go work on that and solve it and make it better for everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can create that type of environment, yeah. that's what you're looking for. That's how you thrive. That's how you out innovate. That's how you deliver customer success, right? And that's your competitive advantage, not money. Boom. Not money, right? It's not, it's not a monetary. It's not a product. I always jokingly say is if you don't take care of your people, you could have the best product in the world that nobody ever heard about. 100%. And I think that is, I think that's so, so important. And, and you talked about it a little bit earlier too, Robert, is that a lot of organizations as they grow, they're adding layers of management in between. So it's yeah. every tower up top frontline worker. How many, how many times is that message from the frontline worker saying this is a problem? Then it's, then it's we're playing the telephone game and it's like, well, this is kind of a problem. Well, we don't have a problem here. And then all of a sudden, like you said, they have this false um, sense of security at the top, thinking that they have a culture because they're only being told um, from their inferiors or people below them that everything's peachy, everything's cool, and everything's okay. Um, one of the things, too, that I love with the sentiment analytics and because we talk about and you, you said it earlier, too, is trust, right? PwC, a lot of these massive, massive organizations are understanding the importance of trust, right? Trust delivers resiliency, right? If I don't trust my peers, my direct manager or senior leadership, I'm no longer resilient in that organization. Everybody's trying to find out what, what drives resilience. And a lot of it requires people to look inward, right? Sometimes it's hard um, to hear or look in the mirror to understand what things that we are maybe doing and not aware of. But the sentiment analytics back to that point that you were making, I feel like in your case study, it sounded like senior leadership was really tapped into utilizing the tool and it's a one-on-one -on -one communication and they could be directly communicating with that frontline worker, solving a lot of the problems or challenges, business challenges that they're facing by simply listening. Did I hear that correctly? That's exactly right. In fact, you know, there, 
that organization on our platform is, you know, we benchmark you against other organizations and they're the highest rated organization on the entire platform. And the key to that really is, is that leadership, you know, a lot of executive leadership will pass this on to someone else, right? And just say, oh, well, yeah, that's somebody else's job or, hey, you guys handle all this type of stuff, which is interesting because that's the most important thing to drive all of your other outcomes. Mm -hmm. And when you start to recognize that, and that's what these guys did, the executive leaders actually trade off. There's uh, five core executives in this company and they trade off each week engaging and having some of those conversations. Now Mm -hmm. we do the majority so that they can do what they do. Mm -hmm. But what they've learned is that they actually rotate. They're on a rotation (laughs) and they rotate each one of them doing that because they've learned how critical that is for them to be in touch with the literal live mindset of exactly how their people are thinking and feeling. Because then when they get into those executive meetings, making choices and decisions, they are armed with the insight they need and the understanding they need to make the right decisions. And it's funny because Carrie was telling me that, you know, at one point she's like, well, you know, we started that way because it was so critical through the pandemic to really do that. But then as things started changing and, you know, things were going back to normal, some of, there was a few people on the executive team like, hey, well, you know, do we all need to be involved with this or should, you know, just HR take care of this? Yeah. And they sat there as an executive team and bottom line, it was that, yeah, there's nothing more critical and more important for us to do literally then understand that because that's how we're making all these great decisions and that's driving everything we're doing in our business. So it was interesting that they went through that almost like, Hey, we'd really need it. And then, Oh, now things are getting better. So maybe we don't need to focus on that as much, but then wisely they recognize, well, that's the whole key to all of our success. So they've continued that. That's really exciting because it's like, it's, it's almost like, um, right. We talk about when it becomes a habit, right? Uh, it takes 30 days of doing something in order right. for it to become an actual habit. Um, and I think a lot of businesses, right. I hope we learn from this experience from the pandemic because it's not going away. We're, we're all watching the news now of this Delta right. variant and it's coming back with a vengeance. Right. And I, 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 I hate when leaders <laughs> say that I can't wait to get back to normal. And it sounds like this organization that's actually listening to their employees understand that better than most because they're actively listening to their employees on a daily basis, that that, there's a new normal today. Um, And just coming to that realization. Now, something to to end on, um, you went through your same evolution as a leader, right? And we're talking here at the HR revolution is, is revolutionizing the way HR does business for the evolution of business. Um, What do you know to be true about culture? Is it something that um, is top down and that is delivered down to the employees? Or are you finding it that culture is even smaller, let's say, and it's more on even just a personal one-on-one relationship because we know the stats on why people leave organizations. Is it the big culture or is it that one-on-one relationship with the manager and employee? Well, I, I really think it's both. Um, I personally believe that it starts with the leadership within an organization. They have to set and establish that and put the focus on it as an organization. Um, you know, because what I've noticed is that we're not successful or we're less successful, I should say, Mm -hmm. when we don't have executive leadership and buy-in. If I don't have that within an organization to drive the change, because the problem is the disconnect between the actions. The key to all of it is, look, you got to listen and understand, figure out exactly what's happening, what's going on, you know, all of those things. But what I share with people is the most key, the most important thing after you know that is to take that action. Mm -hmm. Because if you t- can't take the action, then it's just like anything else you've done mm-hmm. where, hey, yeah, we listened to you. We threw out, we asked you some questions, we gathered some insight, but if you don't do anything with it, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I say, look, from a top down perspective, we have to make sure that we're embedded into the organization 
at a level that action can be taken based on the insights that are gathered. So if I don't have executive leadership bought into, you know, driving quick and fast action, then you might as well not engage with my platform. Yeah. because I, I'm no better than an annual survey if you don't exactly. listen and take action and then measure exactly. your progress and rinse and repeat. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's the scientific method, but you just keep doing it, right? Yeah. So that's why I'm insanity at that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's all about, you know, you have to have vision and leadership that's driving it because you have to be somewhere in the organization where they have the ability to actually take the action, Mm -hmm. the ability to make the decisions and choices. And that's where a lot of times I see the struggle is, is because at the front lines in many organizations, why there's such a disconnect is because, yeah, they're the ones down there having the issues, the problems, you know, whatever's going on, they're telling their managers, well, their managers aren't empowered enough to be able to make choices and decisions. So then they roll it up. Well, that person's not experiencing it every day. So they don't recognize that it really matters that much. So you you end up with this whole disconnect piece as you do that. And that's where if we can connect now what's happening on the front lines to the top lines, Mm -hmm. and they can literally see, well, now we're able to provide the insight of what's really happening. And again, once you have a clear understanding, then take the action And of course, measure it because one of my other favorite statements is you can't move the needle if you don't have a needle. Yeah. And if you don't have needles on your people and culture, like literally, we can track trust. We can track every one of your organizational values. You have them on the wall, but are you living them? Exactly. How are you protecting them? I can put them in a metric and I can show you. And that's uh, awesome. That's awesome. It's phenomenal. So, and then the last thing I, I would say, so. Well, so bottom line, yes, it's executive leadership is key. And then, of course, yes, now you're getting down into the individual leaders because the direct boss or the direct manager, there's really three things that I think are almost the most critical. The relationship with my boss, the relationship with my team, and then my belief in your product and services or your organization, Mm -hmm. my alignment with you guys. Those three things I look at and we create what we call our predictive indicators. Mm -hmm. Because what we've shown is, for example, you know, people are always talking about, hey, customer success, and they're much more willing to go give money to, hey, we want to improve our customer success and drive that up, right? And they're willing to spend money on that. But then when it comes to people and culture, they're like, oh, well, that's that's nice. That's a nice to have, right? (laughs) Yeah, always. But what they haven't connected is that I can actually track in those metrics, those are predictive leading indicators to that customer. I can literally predict your customer service experience 30 to 60 days in advance. Depends on each company and the type of products and services you have, but I can literally, my metrics go like this and then your metrics go like this. And then your met, my metrics go like this and your metrics go like this on customer success. So they're literally sit there and follow the same track. And with each company, we figure out how long that is. But that's what I try to help companies do is Mm -hmm. let me help you find the leading and predictive indicators that are driving your business outcomes. This isn't all, you know, Aaron Aim said it um, at UKG, you know, he's done a phenomenal job of driving people and culture there. And he said, look, I didn't do this because I just wanted to be happy, people to be happy which of course he did, you know, that's, of course you do. Mm -hmm. But what he's saying is, look, I knew this was my most strategic business. Uh, I'm trying to think of exactly the words that he said, but the most strategic move that I could make was to focus on people and culture because they drive all of my outcomes. And that's what you see in the world's most successful organizations. They've recognized and attached the fact that their people and culture drive their ultimate outcomes. Mm -hmm. And that you can't succeed over here. You can't attract. He's like, we were losing 40% of people in, in some of these, our churn rates in some of these different departments. Yeah. You know, I can't grow a business. I literally can't grow a business if we're doing that. So they dove in and they figured out and they have this manager effective. They have amazing. Mm-hmm. Now they track and they identified where their good and bad managers are. And then they pr- created trainings to help them improve and all this. So it's all about the data, taking action, and then measuring your progress. And incrementally, he didn't do it overnight. It took him yeah. years. Yeah. But piece by piece, incrementally, now they're just crushing it. Yeah. So 
Anyways, and I, th- I think it's, a, it's just being in tune with that, with, with your people. And I think that uh, we all have busy lives, right? A lot of people will, the clock will hit six and they can't wait to go home to their personal life or five, whatever time that they're getting let off for the day. Um, and I think that we're missing a lot of that intellectual and social capital um, within our walls that we are paying for. And that's what we're all about, about the HR evolution is really helping HR practitioners understand how they can be, be providing more value back to the organization. How much more value did your product, when that, when used effectively by senior leadership in HR, craft their ways of communication of probably some of those tough, difficult business decisions and the example that you gave us, how did that help alter like the way that they communicated certain strategies and how much did it buy them in, in trust? My friend, Bob Whipple talks about his trust meter. Um, but it's, it's how often are we making deposits, right? It's just like a bank account. We kind of constantly be making deposits because undoubtedly there's going to be withdrawals. When we find hardship, we're going to have to take some withdrawals. But it seems like this company prevented their bottoms from falling out by really listening and being in tune with those sentiment analytics. It's one thing, like you said earlier, to know with Google Maps, if we don't know where we're starting, so point A, um, with the data, the, the metrics, the KPIs that we may be taking today, like turnover rates and ter- first 90 day turnover, voluntary, involuntary. But if we're just simply sitting at the executive table and, and saying, CEO, our turnover percentage is 25%, there's really limited value until you take that next step. Well, let me tell you then why our turnover rate has increased by 5%. We have asked our people how much more yeah. valuable is that to drive business decisions, right? It's no longer their gut instinct or intuition. They now have data and insights to support those actions. So, uh, you know, you mentioned it like with the, the return to work and everything that's going on there, you know, yes, I could tell an organization, Hey, you're, you're at, when we first start with them, we could help them to understand, Hey, you're at 30%, you know, churn rates in these departments we could then help them learn why. Mm-hmm. But the most important thing after that long term that I can do is when they're about to make that choice, like for example, hey, we're going to require everybody to come back to work and work in the office and be here eight to buy, you know, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, I could tell you before you implemented that, if that's what you thought you wanted to do, mm-hmm. I could help you to understand the impact of that choice and decision and tell you how that's going to impact you before you make the change. Oh, yeah. So instead of going and doing that and then having the hard way, 20%, yeah, (laughs) fighting the repercussions, right? Yeah. Well, I could tell you, we could go out and ask your people how that would affect them. We could get that feedback and sentiment. And then I can tell you exactly, okay, if you deploy this, here's what you should expect to see from your people. Mm -hmm. Because I know we've asked them. It's so funny to be all the time. People and companies make choices all the time Mm -hmm. with little to no insight from their people. And if you just ask and engage, you can listen and learn and make the right choices. Mm-hmm. It's so phenomenal yeah. and it's so easy, yeah. but yet it's, it's almost like people don't recognize that you can do that. And that's yeah. where we're trying to obviously get the word out about, hey, this is why sentiment analytics are so important mm-hmm. because on that return to work, on the, all these different things, DE&I, you know, all the major initiatives that people are going after, I see people, companies just throwing best practices or, hey, I read this in a magazine or this person said this was a good idea or, hey, let's throw a a hiring bonus, you know, of, you know, $5,000 at these people to get them to come to work for us. So they're throwing money darts at a dartboard, hoping something sticks. Mm -hmm. And our approach is completely different. No, let's go figure out what we need to do because, do you really want a person that came to your company, you know, because just you for gave monetary them purposes? Well, <laughs> yeah. The next one that gives them six thousand next month, they're just going to hop over there. <laughs> exactly. That's you know, what I, so that's it's, what I say too, Robert. It's it's a, the monetary. If we're incentivizing them monetarily, right? Then what, in the second, like we know the war for talent is right now. Like, yeah. How if if that's all that's keeping them a part of your organization, the next person, like you said, with the next best offer. They're jumping ship, right? If they don't have anything yeah. tying them to the organization, they're going to talk with their feet, like we talked about earlier. Yeah. This was such an awesome conversation. <laughs> and anybody that is um, one of the things, too, Robert, in closing is we talk about time, right? We, you and I talk about HR, right? We know the importance of HR. We believe that HR has the power to change the world. 
when properly armed with the right tools, the right uh, processes, but also the right business acumen to be getting the talking finance to drive these types of action. This That's tool, right. Illumo, I can't help but say it, it, it probably helps HR become more strategic in a less time consuming way than the old methodologies of these surveys. And then they put them into an Excel spreadsheet and then try to make heads or tails of, right? So yeah. you're giving HR more time back in their day with a more efficient turnkey solution like Alumo offers, but you're also arming the entire business with new knowledge and new information that they never had before. And at the end of the day, this is how we believe HR can flip from a cost center to a profit center is by adding more value and taking costs and making them investments, right? Or expenditures today and making them investments. It's being smarter with our time and focusing on the areas of importance, because like you said, there's so much information out there. I feel like a lot of leaders and a lot of organizations right now are suffering from paralysis from over analysis. Um, there's so much information. They don't know what's pertinent or relevant to them. And then they just follow trends. Like you said, they're not setting their own trends, listening to their own people as to what's important. And at the end of the day, it's almost like a cash burning exercise in a bonfire. It's, it's, it's a spray and pray method like we talked about. With this tool allows organizations to take that highly focused, individualized approach that is really going to drive the business forward. It's not how you got to where you are today. It's important to understand where you, how you got to where you are today. But how you got to where you are today is not going to be to where it's going to lead you for tomorrow. And we know that the business is changing so rapidly. So if you get yeah. a chance, Robert, how can they find out more information about Alumo and what you guys are doing? Well, one last thing, I, I just have to jump in on Please that do. last statement because you know I, I love to share with HR that the language of business is numbers. Mm -hmm. And by becoming that, if, if you're looking to transition because you and I both know that look, traditional HR as HR has been is quickly going away. Mm -hmm. You need to be a strategic leader and a value to the organization. And the way to do that, you know, I had a CHRO uh, a little while ago and she was almost in tears with me. Mm -hmm. And she said, look, you've given me the tools that I needed to do what I could never do before. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what was that? And she said, look, the problem I had is I was always talking to our executive leadership about people and culture and how we need to do this and how this drives this. But it was literally like they were blindfolded and they never could see it. You know, I was always struggling to try to get things done or approved or anything. It was like pulling teeth. I, I pretty much gave up at, on it. But when you gave me the Illumo tool and those live visual dashboards that showed by team and department and location exactly how and where we were performing, it was literally like I was finally speaking the language, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where now she was talking in numbers and quantifying mm -hmm. things and saying, hey, here's exactly where our strengths and weaknesses are. And for the first time, they could visually see it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest things that I've seen with the power of the tool is that we bring it visually, mm -hmm. quantified into numbers so that you can know and understand exactly where in the organization to focus your efforts most importantly, through those anonymous, individualized conversations, back and forth conversations where we literally talk to your people, not just a, a survey. And that's one thing I'm not sure we highlighted very well was that our people actually communicate back and forth and converse yeah. back and forth to listen and learn and show empathy and help them mm -hmm. understand and learn about their experience. So that's why the tool is so powerful. But yeah, th so they can learn about us at alumo.com. Um, send me a direct email at robert at alumo.com uh, or reach out and connect with us there on our website is probably the best way. There's a variety of ways and options to connect. So Awesome, awesome. Well, everybody, I would encourage you guys uh, to, to his earlier point, that conversation with the CHRO, sometimes uh, we're brought to tears because we're finally able to, to, to have that conversation and, and that proverbial seat at the table, Robert, that you mentioned we're finally able to add value at that at seat of the table. And when you add value, you're gonna be you're gonna be listened to it and heard and asked to drive business decisions, right? Business strategy, if you're there providing new information and new knowledge that can impact, right, a potential devastating uh, catastrophic impact, like um, when we're not listening to our employees and we force them back and then 25% of the workforce leaves. It allows us to be those strategic guidance business partners. So get yourself a conversation with Robert. Um, him and I can talk all day about uh, the importance, but 
it is a big clear difference between just analytics, metrics, and data, um, and the sentiment, right? It's one thing to know what our problems are and where they are, but it's a whole different ball game when we're able to use the Simon Sinek way of understanding the why, right? When we understand the why, we're able to drive effective change, prevent catastrophic failures, and actually um, eliminate any potential roadblocks along the way using those Google Maps to understand where we are at, at, at point A to get us to point B, missing out on those traffic jams and lights and all the other fun stuff. So Robert, thank you so much for this conversation today. I hope it was helpful for the HR community as well as the finance and leadership community as there are tools out there to make you more effective leaders, but also make you more effective as a business and more profitable in the long run. So thanks so much, Robert, for stopping by. This was Thanks, awesome. Kevin. It was a pleasure. Appreciate oh, it. Thanks so speak. much. Thank you.